Good morning. President of the World Jurist Association and World Law Foundation, Javier Cremades, His Majesty, King Philippe VI of Spain, His Excellency, Mr. Guillermo Lasso, President of Ecuador, His Excellency, Mr. Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada, Her Excellency, Ms. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, Mr. Courtney Rattray, Chef de Cabinet to the United Nations General Secretary, Mr. Miguel de Serpa Suarez, Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and UN Legal Counsel, Excellencies, authorities, judges, and panelists from more than 60 countries gathered here today, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the closing ceremony of the World Law Congress New York 2023 at the United Nations headquarters. I am Hillary Bass, a trustee of the World Law Foundation, former president of the American Bar Association, and your host today. And this I am Patricia Lee Rifo, a member of the steering committee uh, of this Congress and a former president of the American Bar Association and also your other host today. Um, as many of you know, throughout the last year, uh, the Congress held online and in-person opening sessions, and yesterday, hundreds of delegates from all over the globe gathered to discuss a wide variety of relevant and current topics. This is the 60th anniversary of the first World Law Congress held in Athens, Greece in 1963. For the opening of the ceremony, I would like to call President Javier Cremades to the podium. Today, we close the World Law Congress New York 2023, recognizing those institutions and individuals whose outstanding work has strengthened the rule of law, improving our society. And on a personal note, I want to thank Javier for his tremendous commitment to this organization and to the furtherance of the rule of law around the globe. Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Hilary, Patricia. It's a pleasure. Your Majesty, King Felipe, President of Ecuador, Guillermo Lasso, President of the European Commission, dear Ursula von der Leyen, Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, dignitaries, distinguished jurists and friends, we're entering the central point of our 2023 Biannual Congress. On behalf of the World Jurist Association, welcome again to New York. This city is many things at the same time. Some see New York as the capital of the world. Others see it as the World Economic Center or as a place of discovery and experimentation. Perhaps of greater significance, it is the home of the United Nations, the greatest experiment in history to make open discussion and face-to-face -face gathering a meaningful avenue to avoiding help, conflict, and war. The United Nations is the only institution which can claim to represent the whole humanity. We, from the World Jurist Association, are excited to be hosting this gathering in the United Nations building. I actually can't think of a more fitting place to celebrate the rule of law thus, than this symbolic center of peace and justice through law. The values which are at the very core of the World Jurist Association are the same as the aspirational values of New York and the United Nations. Justice, diversity, cooperation, peace, and the pursuit of human development. We're honored that such a prominent and distinguished group of jurists and world leaders have gathered with us here to honor, celebrate, and yes, defend the rule of law from attacks around the world. We are humbled and so proud that you have honored the World Jurist Association with your attendance and participation. The working panels yesterday and today's award ceremony are compelling proof that the need to pursue justice through law remains critical and cannot be taken for granted. The panels prove the need 
and the award recipients confirmed that change is possible despite the difficulties. The importance of the work of the WGA is unchanged since its founding 60 years ago. Unfortunately, our collective commitment to protecting the rights of all people remains as essential today as it has ever been. Before we officially recognize and honor the lifetime commitment of these incredible individuals who promote and preserve the rule of law, I want to acknowledge past and present. The first is to remember why are we here? What animates our work? The rule of law is the only alternative to the rule of force. As El Warren, Chief Justice of the United States, said so precisely in Athens 60 years ago at the gathering of the First World Law Congress, there is still hope that humanity will live in peace and freedom. And if, and only if, we all accept a world ruled by laws and not by force, ideology a party or an autocrat. That world is still achievable and requests our faith, work, and loyal commitment. The last years of Warren's life were committed in addition to his work on the bench to develop the international network of jurists driven by one single purpose, promoting rule of law as the only way to guarantee the protection of human rights. We are the sacred successors of what he helped to create and start. The second is to acknowledge the work of the American Bar Association as an institution that promoted the program Peace Through Law, which ultimately gave birth to what became the World Jurist Association. In 1958, the ABA, chaired by Charles Ryan, provided the human and financial support which was necessary to begin this project. I also pay homage and express profound gratitude to those who helped create this institution and have continued to support the efforts over the years. In particular, both the U.S. Supreme Court and the American Bar Association have joined efforts with thousands of jurists from around the globe to work for peace, liberty, and human rights. You both, Justice Kennedy and the President of the American Association, are a sign of it. The great Kennedy, the great Justice of the United States, have been so involved, including your invaluable efforts in the Beijing 2005 Conference, Wall of Congress. We are also honored that you have joined us today. We also recognize Justice Stephen Breyer, who has been a meaningful and important participant in this World Law Congress, particularly in the opening ceremony hosted in this building last April. I also must pay tribute to my friend and mentor, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who guided and provided great advice to me when I first undertook the effort as president of the WGA. In 2019, also Hilary Bass, Patricia Lerifo, James Sinkernat, and today, Deborah Enix Ross, prior and current American presidents are actively engaged with WGA. These leaders and others from the United States today with the president of the New York City Bar, Susan Coleman, provide the work and encouragement needed as we seek to achieve the original goals set by Ryan and Warren. We are also presenting this morning the World Peace and Liberty Award to Ursula von der Leyen. She will be receiving this high recognition as a representative of the European Union. This union is still a junk reality and has been in the 70 years, in the last 70 years, creating a vision of prosperity, collaboration, freedom, and dignity for millions of people. I had the great pleasure to meet you and to talk to you, dear Ursula, in the days previous to this gathering while in Brussels. The individuals who work at the youth headquarters with you approach public service the way it should be approached, based on commitment, preparation, professionalism, integrity, and humanity. Mrs. von der Leyen is particularly connected with the origin of the UN. She was born in Brussels. Ursula von der Leyen is the mother of seven and brother of eight brothers and sisters, and the president of almost 400 million of Europeans today. Yes, Ursula. You are indeed the face of Europe. When the board of directors of the WGA in Washington, D.C., almost two years ago, decided to grant the European Union the World Peace and Liberty Award, we also asked ourselves, where should we make the phone call? To whom should we reach out? It was very clear to us who we should call. We call you, and here we are. The rule of law is the basic value of the European Union, and it's enshrined in Article 2 of the Founding Treaty. Equally, it is linked to other Union founding values, such as democracy 
and respect of human rights. The European Court of Justice has made very clear that these values are not merely a statement of intentions, but an integral and enforceable part of the very identity of the European Union as a common legal order. I really think that all of us have to recognize that the European integration process has been a success. Peace among all states and prosperity has been delivered. The European integration is not a static process, but a highly dynamic one. Dynamism has characterized its expanded membership from the initial six European states to today's 27 members. And that expansion has not ended. The Union has a dynamic as well in the reach of its interests and policies. From the initial 1951 field of the community's coal and steel interests to the very large field of its present economic and political responsibilities, based on treaties and developed by the European Union legislation. Nowadays, these fields cover most of the central areas affecting lives of European citizens. They include not only the economy and related policies like environment, digital energy and competition, but also basic individual rights recognized by the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. This means that the European Union is the rule of law itself in a way that permeates to the whole life of its states, their societies, their companies and their people. President von der Leyen, I can affirm with great conviction that during your mandate, you and your commission, colleagues, have put in practice the rule of law principle through concrete actions to a remarkable and unprecedented degree in the history of the European integration process. You have given a new push for European democracy as one of the key policy priorities of the Commission agenda for the period 2018-2024. Here today, we have legal representation from 80 different countries at the highest level. And you are all crucial to fulfilling our goal of protecting, serving, and helping ordinary people, institutions, and companies through active use of the law and achieve and to achieve good. We hope to do it a better, fair, and more democratic world where all people are recognized as valuable and deserving of equitable treatment under the law. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. I would like to call Mr. Courtney Retre, Chef de Cabinet, to the United States Secretary General to the podium. His Majesty, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the United Nations. I'm pleased to greet all participants of the World Law Congress. Allow me first to congratulate the World Jurist Association on its 60th anniversary. I also wish to extend my compliments to the awardees. This gathering represents a wide range of expertise from across legal systems, judges, lawyers, professors, and other experts, transcending national boundaries and united to strengthen and expand the rule of law. I know that much of your discussions have focused on advancing peace through law, the association's original motto. It is also a mission shared by our founding document, the United Nations Charter which reminds us that law is fundamental to international peace, security, and cooperation. Law also underpins our daily work to bring to life the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, celebrating its 75th anniversary this year. The eternal principles enshrined in the Declaration, freedom, equality, justice, must be embraced not only in word, but in deed, across economic and social systems worldwide, across legislation and policies, and across 
our efforts to ensure that perpetrators of human rights abuses do not escape unpunished. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in so many ways, law is a lighthouse, essential to bringing all of humanity's best aspirations to life. But as we meet today, that beam of hope is growing dimmer by the day. The world is afflicted by inequalities, conflicts, climate disasters, and poverty. Human rights are abused, violated, and flouted with impunity. And geopolitical division, mistrust, and disputes are running rampant between countries and regions across the world. As keepers of law's light, we need your creative and collaborative legal approaches to tackle today's growing global challenges in three key areas in particular. First, by strengthening and building trust in the global instruments designed to underpin a more peaceful and trusting world. This includes the United Nations Charter and its many tools to ensure that disputes are settled peacefully. Second, by ensuring that justice is people-centered and accessible to all, and that the perpetrators of human rights violations and abuses are held accountable for their actions. Now marking its 25th anniversary, the International Criminal Court is increasingly critical in this regard. It has jurisdiction over the most serious crimes of concern to the international community. The United Nations and the ICC share a common purpose to ensure that justice is available to all and that those found guilty of the most serious violations of human rights are held accountable. And third, we need much stronger rule of law in the wild west of cyberspace. We currently lack the legal tools necessary to respond to emerging challenges, including digital technologies, which are too often used to violate human rights. Governments, legal experts, academia, the private sector, and civil society must come together with a sense of urgency to build common tools so that technology serves humankind, human rights, and the common good. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, across all these areas, the World Jurist Association and this Congress exemplify the true spirit of international cooperation and understanding. I thank you all for your efforts and innovative ideas that reaffirm the vital role of the legal community in shaping a more peaceful, just, and equitable world. I trust that you will leave this Congress with a renewed sense of purpose to strengthen the rule of law and make the promise of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights a reality for everyone, everywhere. I wish you success and thank you for your commitment. Thank you, Mr. Atre, for your comments. It is now my privilege to call to the podium his Honor, Judge Rowan D. Wilson, the Chief Judge of New York. Judge Wilson. Good morning, Your Majesty, Excellencies, distinguished guests. On behalf of the uh, New York State Unified Court System, I extend our great appreciation and admiration to the World Law Congress and the World Jurist Association for your many decades of work to expand and defend the rule of law. It is particularly heartwarming that on the 60th anniversary of the World Law Congress, New York is once again its host. Because I am surrounded by an uncommonly distinguished audience in what is perhaps the world's most famous forum, I decided to begin with the moral of a children's movie, Disney's Ratatouille. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, the anti-hero, a harsh food critic, scorns a, a famous chef's motto that anyone can cook. But he comes to realize that the motto does not mean that everyone can be a great chef, but rather 
that a great chef can come from anywhere, even from the most humble origins. So too can a great visionary, scholar, statesman, and leader. As relevant today, that person is Charles Ryan. Charles Ryan was instrumental in founding the World Jurist Association and the World Law Congress. Most of you know that. He also created Law Day, which courts and lawyers throughout the United States celebrate every year to emphasize the rule of law over military might, aggression, and the concomitant chaos they bring. Before that, Charles Ryan desegregated the Washington, D.C. Bar Association and the Duke University Board of Trustees. As the youngest president of the American Bar Association, he created the World Peace Through Law Program, which he described as based on the principle that, and I quote, the only way to end war is to provide effective and acceptable machinery for deciding disputes peacefully under a rule of law. He also argued and won in the United States Supreme Court perhaps the most consequential case for our democracy and the one that Ch Chief Justice Warren cited as the most important case decided under his tenure, Baker v. Carr, which established the one person, one vote principle. Charles Ryan, like the protagonist in Ratatouille, came from the humblest of beginnings. He was born on a small cotton farm in 1912. His family's farm was wiped out by the boll weevil, and his mother died shortly thereafter when Charles was 12. His father remarried, giving him six instant siblings with more to come. He graduated high school at age 14 from a one-room schoolhouse. Charles's family had no money for college, so Charles took a job as a bicycle messenger. He applied to several colleges, only Duke University admitted him, and they took all the money that he had saved up except for $5. After his first year, he had no money to return to Duke, so he began selling Bibles to coal miners during the Great Depression. He then worked as a prize fighter in Denver and as a cattle rancher in Wyoming. When he severely injured his hand and could no longer work as a carpenter to pay for the rest of law school, he moved to Washington, D.C., got a government job, and finished law school there. I cannot be Charles Ryan. Neither can most of us. A great chef like Gandhi, like Mandela, like King, may come from the humblest of beginnings, but my message to you is that the advancement and the preservation of the rule of law cannot be made to depend on the miraculous appearance of a great chef, but rather on a multitude of devoted cooks working tirelessly, as each of you do, to preserve the rule of law. The rule of law is constantly threatened, and only through your perpetual vigilance and determined efforts can we meet the challenge of fostering peace through the rule of law? Thank you for your long-standing and unwavering commitment to that goal. Thank you for your remarks, Judge Wilson. It is now my great privilege to introduce Ambassador Andrew Young, an American civil rights icon also a U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and the Mayor of Atlanta from 1982 to 1990, and of course, a World Peace and Liberty Awardee. Ambassador Young, we look forward to your remarks. I don't know whether it's fortunate or unfortunate, but I'm not a lawyer. And I'm reminded now of uh, an old Negro spiritual which says, if ever we needed the Lord before, we sure do need him now. I would paraphrase that. If ever we needed the law before, we sure do need the law now. We welcome you. And I intended to congratulate King Felipe because uh, we were also very proud uh, to watch a young Spaniard uh, win Wimbledon. <laughs> and um, even in sports, there is hope that every so often somebody comes along with a new idea a new energy, a new vision, and things change. We hope that you bring us, in addition to law, grace 
and mercy and forgiveness and that you lead us in spirit and in fact uh, to justice through grace and mercy. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you, Ambassador Young. We can only hope to make a small percentage of the contributions to the rule of law that you have shown us throughout your life. It is now my great pleasure to give the floor to the Honorary Anthony Kennedy, the Senior Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States. Justice Kennedy. Your Majesty, Excellencies, and my fellow citizens from nations around the world who are committed to preserving the idea and the reality of the rule of law and the freedom that it must always preserve. Some of your organizers asked me to mention the first World Jurist Conference uh, that it was my pleasure to attend, which was in China in the year 2005. My uh, lecturing had taken me uh, uh, rather frequently in those days to China, and the judges were preparing for the agenda. And uh, it without meaning to intrude, I phoned the president, President Greenberg at the time, and he said, oh, go, go ahead and, and help them. So it was uh, fascinating to meet with the judges and to see how excited they were about the possibility of having a world-based organization talk in their country about judicial independence and judicial integrity they had real hope that they would be seen as judges in the rest of the world because of their independence and their integrity, which they thought they might be able to, to, to reach. Um, in, in, in part of my uh, preparation for teaching in China for many years, it was a, uh, fascinating to read the works of Confucius, who are, he, he didn't write, but they preserved by writers like Mencius, just like you would never have heard of Socrates without Plato. Um, Mencius uh, talked about Confucius. Mencius tells this story, and he wrote this in 500 BCE, 500 years uh, BCE. He told the story of a man walking uh, through a distant country far from his own, and he sees a small child ready to crawl to the top of the well where he can fall in. Does the stranger have a duty to rescue the child? The answer, 500 years uh, BCE, uh, before the Christian era was yes. Throughout the world, the human instinct is that there is a moral duty. The human has certain moral duties. Uh, regardless of, your, of, 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 of religion or your nationality, we are united in a sense of what is morally right. Now, there are some there are some even who hold positions of leadership in tyrannical countries today who are sociopaths and psychopaths 
and who not, do not believe in morality, but they are not representative of the humankind that we ought to be and the humankind that we are. Should the duty to rescue that's moral be put into a legal obligation? Even as we speak here today, the so-called duty to rescue, which is the way the law refers to this, is, is the subject of debate in certain states. In Europe, the duty is uh, generally more extensive than it is here. Uh, but we are united in this idea that we have a, a, a moral framework that we share and, and that unites us in the rule of law. Some of your organizers asked me today uh, to mention what we talked about in the panel, which is that the, uh, it's the duty of the judge uh, to, to, to remember what the oracle at Delphi said, know thyself. Every judge, every day, in every case, must ask himself, must ask herself, who am I? Why am I about to rule this way? Generally, the judge will know what to do, to follow the law, follow precedent. But the judge owes it to that litigant to ask the question, who am I? And the judge may find that despite his initial or her initial inclinations, there's a new horizon, a new vista, which takes the rule of law and the freedom it protects to her new horizons, the horizons that this association seeks always to meet. Thank you very much. Thank you, Justice Kennedy, for your remarks and for continuing to be an inspiration to so many of us. We will now proceed with the presentation of the World Peace and Liberty Award. I would like to call Vivian Redding, Vice President of the World Law Foundation, to the podium for the reading of the act granting the World Peace and Liberty Award. Your Majesty, President Ursula von der Leyen, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The following resolution was adopted by the World Jurist Association's Board of Directors. Whereas the World Jurist Association is a non-governmental organization with special consultative status at the United Nations Economic and Social Council, it provides a unique, free and open forum for the international judicial community where judges, lawyers, law professors, law students and legal professionals from around the world can work cooperatively to promote, strengthen and expand the rule of law and its institutions throughout all the nations of the world. A world ruled by law, not force, has been the world's jurist association's uh, motto since 60 years, since its foundation in 1963. Through events such as this World Law Congress, the association continues to build on its foundation, calling for a system of laws that will ensure peace and equality without the use of force and advocating for values such as human dignity and equality. Whereas, the rule of law is the only alternative to the rule of force. Only through the rule of law can human beings live in peace and freedom. The World Jurist Association has over the years granted awards to those who have strengthened and protected the rule of law. Among them, Winston Churchill, René Cassin, Nelson Mandela, 
His Majesty the King of Spain, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Andrew Young, and the Colombian people led by their president, Ivan Duque. Whereas the values of the World Juries Association are reflected in the successful process of European integration, based on the rule of law as a guarantor of the dignity of every person. The European integration is an example of how over so many decades the rule of law contributes to achieving decisive advances for humanity according to the motto of the World Juries Association, peace through law. Whereas the EU is above all an institution based on the respect for the laws contained in the European treaties and in the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which are in turn based on the international legal documents such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a binding part of the acquis communautaire. The European Union and the European Commission, acting as guardian of the treaties, ensure that member states and their citizens comply with the rule of law. Whereas, as we gather here at the United Nations headquarters on 21st of July 2023, the World Juries Association takes another step in upholding the legacy of the association founders. This year, it grants its highest award that many consider to be the Nobel Prize in Law, the World Peace and Liberty Award to the European Commission, represented by its president, Ursula von der Leyen. Thank you, Vivian. It is now my high privilege to call to the podium His Excellency Justin Trudeau, Prime Minister of Canada for the Laudatio for the European Commission. Bonjour, mes chers amis. Good morning, dear friends. Again, by thanking the World Law Congress and Javier Cremades for today's event. I want to acknowledge His Majesty King Felipe VI of Spain, President Lasso, and all the dignitaries gathered here, and of course, and especially my dear friend Ursula von der Leyen, who we are all gathered to honor today along with the European Union. Mes amis, merci. Friends, thank you for meeting today. 80 years ago, that we laid down our weapons after the deadliest war humankind had ever seen. The Second World War left Europe in ruins. It sent millions of people to their graves, people from all over the world, including tens of thousands of Canadians. And it forced a reckoning. For centuries, Europe had been riven with conflict. The continent's history marked by endless rivalries and individual ambitions that led to bloody contests over land, over language, over resources. I should know Canada was a direct byproduct of all of those. But by the middle of the 20th century, leaders understood that the machinery of war had become too dangerous to allow to continue this way. So from the ashes of the Second World War, the European Commission was born. It was created by those who believed that if we tied our fates together through shared prosperity and collective growth, if we respected the rights, freedoms, languages, and cultures of others in return for their respect of our own, if we transcended the destabilizing forces of our individual interests, and united ourselves in a community of values grounded in the rule of law. If we did that, we could overcome the brutal antagonism that had entrenched the continent for centuries and build a lasting peace. 
It was a triumph of imagination over history. La Commission européenne. The European Commission has become a key institution that plays a central role on the global scale. Together, the members of the European Commission represent the third largest world economy and bring together more than half a billion people speaking 24 languages, living in 27 different countries, countries who practice a myriad of different religions and come from all corners of the globe. Processes, institutions and democratic values at the core of the European Commission have enabled peace and prosperity to prevail in Europe over second seven decades now. This is the accomplishment we honor and award the European Commission with today. And to accept the award is my friend Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission. I've worked alongside Ursula for almost four years now. I can tell you that she personally embodies the very best values of the European Commission. She is principled, she is compassionate, she is formidable, and she drives outcomes through respect and consensus. Canada, I suspect, was chosen today to speak to European success in part because, yes, our own history was shaped by the historical power struggles I mentioned earlier, but also because I think we too understand that in this day and age, Differences and diversity can be made into a source of strength and resilience, not a source of weakness. President von der Leyen took her role at a time of uncertainty around the future of Europe. Brexit left many wondering if the Union would continue to hold strong. Euroscepticism was on the rise and protectionism and authoritarianism were becoming more prevalent. Of course, this populism was not just European. Excessive nationalism was breaking through around the world, threatening the principles of collective prosperity. As choruses like America First got louder, both Canada and Europe felt fa held fast to our belief that growth doesn't come from putting up walls or turning inwards, which is why we were able to sign an incredibly ambitious trade deal together against a backdrop of protectionism and insular thinking. Canada and Europe both understand that we are at our best when we are all doing better. We have faced crisis after crisis that has proven this. Just a few months after Ursula took office as president, the pandemic hit, and her steady leadership made a real difference for Europe but also for Canada and for the world. As a medical doctor and as a mother of seven, Ursula understood that we would only get through it if we got through it together. We had many, many conversations during that time. And she always emphasized that true resilience is only assured when we remain not just united by our values, but that we act on them. And that principle is at the very core of the European Commission. What underpins everything Europe and Canada stand for, and our democracies around the world, is the rule of law. Ursula is called the rule of law essential for the protection of the values on which our union is founded. Democracy, freedom, equality, and respect for human rights. This place we're in today, the United Nations, is one of the other great peace-building institutions to rise from the ruins of the Second World War. And its foundational document is the UN Charter. 193 countries are party to this charter, and it is one of the key instruments of international law. Upholding and abiding by this charter is what has led to unprecedented peace, stability, and prosperity around the world, which makes what Vladimir Putin is trying to do a problem for everyone, everywhere. 
l'évasion brutale et non The brutal, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by Putin is another attempt to impose the uh, law of the strongest. And if it succeeds, everybody will suffer. That's why Canada, the EU, and many of our friends and allies will always be there for Ukraine. An equivocally strong supporter of Ukraine, because we may live across the globe, but we must advocate for them at all multilateral tables where each of us have a voice, particularly with emerging economies. Ursula has been absolutely unwavering in her own advocacy for Ukraine and for the rule of law in a European context that is complex. In a time of energy crisis and inflation, it's all the more difficult to hold political consensus but Ursula has been an incredibly effective leader. She has galvanized European support militarily, financially, and politically for Ukraine's defense. And she has helped ensure that the democratic world remains steadfastly behind Ukraine and behind the principles for which it is fighting. Sovereignty, territorial integrity, the rule of law, and the right of peoples to choose their own future. She was one of the first foreign leaders to visit the country after the invasion began. She witnessed the atrocities in Bucha firsthand when there were still body bags in the streets. She understands the scale of the humanitarian crisis and demonstrated her compassion when, in those early weeks of the invasion, she brought the world together to provide refuge and support to the millions of people fleeing Putin's bombs. I was in Kviv last month, where I addressed the Verkhovna Rada. I spoke of how Ukraine is the tip of the spear that is determining the future of the 21st century. Alors, en tant que nation souveraine, as a sovereign, united nation, we must support Ukraine in its fight, regardless of what it must cost and however long it lasts. Authoritarianism win. We must ensure that borders mean something, that might never becomes right, that the ambitions and desires of one entity or of one individual do not stamp out the rights of others. The German writer Thomas Mann described democracy as being built on respect for the infinite dignity of each individual. We cannot take democracy for granted. The European Commission has shown that when we overcome our differences, when we embrace them and forge consensus, that is the most powerful driver of solutions in the world. And this is important because the future holds other enormous challenges. Ce sont les principes et les valeurs que l'on it is the principles and values that we are celebrating together that will allow us to tackle climate change and to protect people from the worst consequences thereof. In leadership, Europe has laid a path to being net zero by 2050. And many European nations have accelerated their work to meet this target as they've moved away from Russian fossil fuels and towards clean energy. And Canada, of course, is ready to be your partner in this work from Germany investing in Canadian hydrogen to Romania drawing on Canadian nuclear ex energy expertise and solutions, among many others. In this highly uncertain moment, we must remember that security policy is climate policy, is economic policy, is social policy. The stability of the rules-based international order calls on us to unwind our dependence on commodities weaponized by authoritarian states as we protect the resilience of our economies from their whims, which means standing up to bullies and protecting those who are suffering the most while ensuring our middle class is strong and inequality does not take hold. This is a consequential moment, and it calls for thoughtful leadership and strong institutions. And I cannot think of a better embodiment of those 
than Ursula von der Leyen and the European Commission. You show us how respect for the dignity of all leads to the strength to protect peace no matter what. And this is what we honor today. Merci beaucoup, mes chers amis. Thank you very much, dear friends. Thank you, Excellency. Um, uh, may I call forward, please, um, King Felipe, Your Majesty, uh, and President Cremades. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ursula van der Leyen as she receives, on behalf of the European Commission, the World Peace and Liberty Award. Vivian Redding and the Honorable Henry Molina, President of the Supreme Court of the Dominican Republic, please to join as well for a photo. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Mrs. Ursula van der Leyden. Your Majesty, dear Justin, my friend, thank you so much for your words. Dr. Javier Cremades, my dearest Vivian Reding, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, what an honor to receive this award on behalf of the European Commission. And this on the occasion of the 60th anniversary of the World Jurist Association, a network of jurists that would defend fundamental rights and the rule of law across the world as a contribution to global peace. 60 years on, you are still faithful to your foundation and your principles. And I want to thank the World's Jurist Foundation Association, not only for this recognition, but for your enduring service for all to all humanity. Peace through the rule of law. This is also the story of a united Europe. When World War II ended, Europe was in ruin and ashes, and European countries' mortal enemies. Five of them decided to forgive. Not forget, but forgive. They stretched out their hand to Germany and others, and over time invited them back into the circle of democracies. Under one condition, to do everything necessary for just and lasting peace grounded on the rule of law. My father was 15 years old when World War II ended. His generation had grown up in Germany, surrounded by lawlessness, devastation, and the negation of human dignity. His country has brought death and destruction to the whole world. Around him was only shame and despair. And then, 
the European idea was born. He was overwhelmed by the power of reconciliation and the rule of law. In 1957, he witnessed the foundation of the European Economic Community, the beginning of the European Union, with only six member states at that time. He dedicated his whole life to serving the European idea. And when he passed in 2014, the European Union had grown to 28 member states. The story of our union is one of democracies, young and old, getting stronger together. It is the story of Germany's and Italy's rebirth after the war. It is the story of Spain's, Portugal's, and Greece's path from dictatorship to democracy. It is the story of democratic renaissance after the fall of the Iron Curtain. And the next chapter in this story is being written today in Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, as well as the Western Balkan. This is Europe's promise, a united continent where all are equal before the law with freedom and democracy for all. But what does it mean for today's Europeans to build peace through the rule of law? What is Europe's mission in this new and turbulent era in the history of the world? This is the question I would like to share some thoughts with you today. The first part of the answer still has to do with the United Nations Charter and global peace. Vladimir Putin has brought war back to the European Union and the European continent. Not only is he committing unspeakable crimes, with cities razed to the ground, children taken from their families, civilians killed in cold blood, this war goes also against the very foundation of the United Nations Charter. It is targeting the very idea of a world order based on the international law, where all sovereign countries have equal rights, and all countries shall refrain from the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. These are the words of the UN Charter, shall refrain from the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. This is why Europe stands by Ukraine for as long as it takes. Ukraine is not only fighting for its own freedom. Ukraine is fighting for the freedom of every country because this is the principle of the United Nations Charter. No one wants peace more than the people of Ukraine. But lasting peace can only be built upon the foundation of international law. An independent Ukraine within its recognized international borders where accountability for war crimes has been met, and with security guarantees so that Ukrainians can be free from fear. This is at the heart of President Zelensky's peace formula. Each of his 10 points is based on the UN Charter and UN resolutions. The Charter must be the starting point for any negotiation for just and lasting peace. There's another reason why this war shows the deep connection between peace and the rule of law. Ukrainians have made a clear choice for the rule of law and democracy. They want to join the European Union. And that means deep and structural reforms 
ranging from the independence of the judiciary to anti-corruption, from minority rights to media freedom. I must say it is amazing to see how fast and determined Ukraine is implementing these reforms despite the war. They are defending their country and reforming. This leads me to my second point. Europe's mission to protect and promote fundamental rights in an ever-changing world. Our union was born as an economic community. Then, step by step, our free trade area has evolved into a community of values. And we cast our values into treaties that protect all people and bind all countries in our union. But our job is not done. It is not enough to write down the promise of equal rights for all human beings. We must also live up to it every single day. Democracy is a constant work in progress. And our constitutional values must constantly be translated into action and guaranteed by the law. Let me mention three examples. First, think about the equality between men and women. It was already spelled out in clear terms in the Universal Declaration right after World War II. But what was the meaning of equality for the post-war generation? It meant freedom to study and to work, freedom from violence in the streets and at home, freedom to marry whomever you love, all of this still holds true today. But gender equality means so much more. It is the right to be a mother and to have a career. It is work-life balance and equal pay for equal work. It is opportunity to become a doctor or a judge, a soccer player or president of the European Commission. It is the power to reach for the top and be anything you want to be in life. You are probably familiar with a quote by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who received this award in 2020, just months before she passed. She used to say that the beautiful words of the US Constitution, we, the people, sounded very different in 1787. Back then, they only referred to white men with property. But then, little by little, we, the people, has become a more inclusive term. And her goal, goal was to keep fighting, and I quote, until we, the people, covers everyone who dwells in this fair land." End of quote. This is Europe's promise, too. A union of equal rights for all the people of Europe. My second example. There is a new frontier of fundamental rights, and it is the digital space. It is a new world where our rules don't always apply automatically. Think about children's rights or consumer protection. But think also about artificial intelligence. Its potential benefits are immense, but it can be harmful, for example, if it is used to hire and fire employees or to monitor citizens through facial recognition. We need new laws to bring our eternal values in the online world. And Europe has been leading the way. We have been the first in the world to set rules for digital platforms, and now we are doing the same with artificial intelligence. 
This means that all companies that want to work on our market must comply with very high standards, standards that put individuals and their rights at the center. And at the same time, we are working with like-minded friends like Canada and the United States, but also Japan, Latin American countries, and India to develop equivalent rules so that technology enhances individual freedom, not the state's ability to control us. Third and final example. The European Union's founding treaties promise solidarity between generations. We have always believed that our children should not pay the price for our actions. But only recently have we understood the full meaning of these words. They mean that we must stop harming our planet to preserve it for our children and grandchildren. And two years ago, Europe became the first continent to turn this commitment into a climate law. This means that climate neutrality in Europe by 2050 is now a legally binding target that can be enforced by our union and in court. We are putting the full force of the law at the service of our planet. This is the role of the European Commission as the guardian of our treaties. We strive to stay true to the high values that our union is built upon. And we ensure that our values apply to all Europeans, men and women, young and old, of all colors, of all sexual orientations, of all faith and none. But we are not alone in this task. It is a responsibility that we all share. We share it with people like you, the judges, the lawyers, the academics, but also the activists, the human rights defenders, the consumer associations, and all the ordinary citizens who bring the law to life. You are the ones making sure that everyone's rights are truly equal that our children are safe online, and that our climate protection laws are fully enforced. You are the backbone of our democracies. You are the backbone of our rule of law. It is thanks to you that the solemn words written years or decades ago in our charters, treaties, and constitutions turn into reality every single day. And this is the beauty of democracy. It is a great, ever unfinished symphony. And it is up to every new generation and each one of us to keep the music going. And this is also the beauty of our European Union. We are the children of great jurists from Kikero to Montesquieu. We are the heirs of the post-war generation who built peace through the rule of law. But the best part of our history is still to be written. The path towards a more perfect union has only just begun. Thank you so much again for the prestigious prize, Long Live Europe. Thank you. Congratulations, Excellency. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it is now my high privilege to call to the podium His Majesty King Felipe VI, 
World Peace and Justice Awardee of 2019, Your Majesty. Good morning, everyone. A true honor to speak to this distinguished audience. Allow me to recognize some of you present. Presidente Constitucional de la República. Constitutional President of Ecuador and First Lady. Mission. Prime Minister of Canada. President and members of the World, World Jurist Association and World Law Congress. Vice President Vivian Reading of the World Law Foundation. Authorities, panelists, participants in this uh, New York 2023 World Law Congress, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to also recognize the presence of uh, the President of the Supreme Court of Justice of the Dominican Republic and two former, three former presidents of uh, Mexico, Ernesto Cedillo, Colombia, Juan Duque, and of Latvia. Mr. Levitz, it's an honor to see you and a pleasure as well. And my fellow OD, Andrew Young, Ambassador Young, I had the pleasure of seeing him in Madrid recently and presenting him the award, and it was a great pleasure as well. It will be tough to follow the uh, sequence today. So many beautiful and important words have been spoken. Allow me to add a few more. A few months ago, on the 8th of May, I presided over the Madrid opening session of this World Law Congress 2023. So to be here with you on this special occasion at this closing ceremony is of course an honor, but also gives me great personal satisfaction. An honor that is multiplied by the significance of this event at which we have just presented the World Peace and Liberty Award to the European Commission, represented by its president, Ursula von der Leyen. So allow me first to offer her my sincere congratulations on this award, which without a question recognizes the most significant project of multinational integration in our recent history. From the outset, it was above all a political and legal project aimed at consolidating peace and democracy in the countries of the continent after World War II. I would also like to extend my congratulations to the recipients today of the World Jewish Association Medals of Honor presented later on in this ceremony. Among them are extraordinary jurists from all over the world, as well as companies that have demonstrated the extraordinary commitment to the rule of law, a commitment shared by all of us here today. So, as I was saying, this in the closing ceremony of the 28th World Congress has taken more than two years of considerable effort to organize and has succeeded in bringing more than 1,000 jurists from 70 different countries the results of the many discussions in different panels will be of the utmost interest and value to legislators, regulators, judges, jurists, and leaders from all over the world. It is no coincidence that for this ceremony we have gathered at this UN headquarters of New York, which in these times of profound transformation in almost all areas of our lives is called upon to perform an, an indispensable role in resolving conflicts and working for world peace and cooperation. Without question, it is a pivotal structure of an international architecture founded upon strong and effective multilateral institutions and a law-based international order. This is an idea that the UN Secretary General has always championed, as I mentioned some months ago when he received the Charles V Award, European Award, in the late emperor's retirement site, the Monastery of Juste in Cáceres. We thank Secretary Guterres for his generous hospitality today. 
Ladies and gentlemen, it is truly a pleasure to be here again at the UN headquarters, a place where, as I mentioned in the Junga of 2016, we must ensure the future of our planet. On this occasion, as I address the World, World Law Congress, I would like to pay tribute to two jurists from the US who together with Sir Winston Churchill set out to mobilize the international legal community in order to promote the rule of law over the rule of might. To this purpose, they founded the World Jurist Association. The legacy of these two men, Charles Ryan and Earl Warren, must be preserved and handed down to future generations. The Bar Association of the District of Columbia elected Charles Ryan as its president in 1955 after he ran on a single pledge to integrate the Bar Association. At this same moment in his life, he struck a friendship with Earl Warren, recently named president of the US Supreme Court. They discussed the need to undertake a global campaign to promote the rule of law as the only alternative to authoritarianism. This has remained the purpose and mission of the World Jurist Association to this day. That friendship between those two men led to the Peace Through Law Program, which has since been renamed the World Jurist Association, the oldest, indeed the only, international association bringing together all branches of the law, judges, lawyers, professors, and other members of the legal profession at a global level, becoming a kind of international voice of the law. The first World Law Congress, as you mentioned before, was held in Athens in 1963, actually when Greece was still under the reign of my grandfather, King Paul I. And it was around this time, too, that this award was established to acknowledge and express gratitude to those international figures who, through their outstanding efforts, have come to symbolize the promotion and defense of the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're here to pay tribute to the European Commission. Madam President, thank you for doing us the honor of being here to personally accept this prize on behalf of the institution you lead. The European Commission and its immediate predecessor, the high authority of the European coal and steel community, is still probably one of the most unique elements of the European Union's institutional architecture, and probably also one of the reasons that explains its remarkable success since the Treaty of Paris of 1951. It acts as an institution that represents the European Union's general interests, making sure that all member states and all parts of the European Union benefit from our union. And it plays a key role, of course, in the European Union's political process through its right of initiative in the legislative process. It also acts as a guardian of the treaties, making sure that all member states and economic actors respect the European law, including its fundamental democratic values, as well as the rules that make up our single market. Today, these duties have become more important than ever before. Ladies and gentlemen, it has been roughly one year and a half since the Russian aggression against Ukraine started. Since then, we have witnessed the return of war to the continent with a massive loss of human lives, millions of refugees pouring out into safety, and a level of destruction that brings us to memory what most of us only knew from history books, documentaries, or movies. We have seen how the pillars on which we have built our European model for decades have been seriously challenged. Today we witness a clash between two visions of the world, to make it simple, one of force and repression, of intolerance and exclusion, the other, the European model, 
based on the values held in Article 2 of the European Union Treaty, such as democracy, human dignity, freedom, equality, the rule of law, and the respect for human rights. Values that are the foundation of the European construction, that are part of the identity of the Union as a political community, and that on such an occasion as today's, remind us of Jean Monnet and Robert Schuman, the founding fathers of an ambitious and hopeful project, the current European Union, whose construction began three quarters of a century ago. And now more than ever, we still need to fight for the European Union as we know it. We need people to lead us and continuously revitalize our trust and our hope in it. Now more than ever, we need the European Union to be a force of good in the world, defending liberty, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of states, also defending a rules-based order in line with the UN Charter. Madam President, you are at the helm of an institution, the European Commission, that has been key to ensure Europe's peace and prosperity for almost 70 years. Like your predecessors, you have faced the different crises and challenges by advocating European solutions. And by doing so, you have contributed to strengthening Europe and push, pushing European integration to new levels. In these polarized times in which we all live, the, the Union needs a strong commission, one that acts as a dependable guardian of the treaties and that keeps up the legislative and political momentum of the reform agenda. At a time when our institutions and norms are being increasingly challenged and even questioned, the European Commission has shown the value of moderation, centrality, and constraint as key traits of doing politics, bringing together all member states in the Council, now presided by Spain for the next six months, and all political groupings around the European Parliament. And in this regard, we must not forget that the advances made in building the European project have responded democratically to the will of our citizens, who have largely agreed to strengthen and enlarge the Union. This is a process in which our national parliaments have also, of course, played a decisive role, embracing plurality, respecting difference, seeking the middle ground in order to move forward, adopting debate and consensus as tools of progress. These actions and attitudes are at the very heart of democracy and essential to preserve it. Because as Europeans, President von der Leyen, I think we clearly share the belief that democracy is today the soul of Europe. Madam President, we thank you once again and congratulate you for this award that recognizes the important role played by the European Commission in safeguarding the European project as one of principles and values, rights and freedoms, prosperity and peace. You know you can always count on Spain in working towards this objective because these times de demand greater unity, and that is how we have responded and will continue to do so within the European framework. We will have to keep maintaining unity both within Europe and together with our key partners, allies and friends, supporting Ukraine and in upholding the international order. In this task, it is important to count on our allies, on the European friends, and of course, countries like this one that hosts us, the United States, and all those like-minded partners, countries and regions, many of them represented here, with whom we share values and principles. And to conclude, and with Spain, as I mentioned, currently holding the presidency of the European Council of uh, the European Union, 
I would like to recall the words of one of our most eminent thinkers, Jose Ortega y Gasset, who reflecting upon Spain's difficulties almost a century ago, he asserted that Europe, far from being a problem, was actually the solution. These words remain true today, not only for Spain, but for all our member states and future member states. So let us continue to believe in the power of the great hope that Europe rep represents in a project worthy of our trust and our efforts for the good of all, but for the good of our countries and our societies. Congratulations again, Madam President, and many thanks to you all. Thank you, Your Majesty. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to pause our proceedings for five minutes as some of our dignitaries must depart. For security reasons, I ask that you remain in your seats. Thank you. Se lo voy a tener que dar por delante, yo creo.
please take your seats so that we can start the program. Now it is. May I please ask that you take your seats? Thank you. Please take your seats. <laughs> Thank you. We will now commence the second part of our program. We will be starting this morning by showing a video of the opening sessions held online and in person during the past year in the framework to the opening of the World Law Congress New York 2023. to join all of you gathered at the United Nations today to celebrate the opening session of the New York World Law Congress. I want to thank the World Jurist Association and its chairman, Javier Cremades, for hosting today's program and for the important work the organization plays in our international community. So congratulations to Justice Breyer and to all the honorees and best wishes to all of you for 60 years, the association has carried out exceptional work, mobilizing the international legal community in a global campaign to promote governance of laws, not of men, the rule of law, not the rule of arbitrary decisions, authoritarianism, and brute force. Now is a good moment to remember that the creation of the World Jurist Association took place at the height of the Cold War to promote an idea that remains extraordinarily relevant only under a government, a governance of laws, under the protection of the law, can we guarantee that citizens and their nations will be able to live in peace and freedom. The point of law is to protect freedom. It's to protect everyone's freedom and to have rules by which we relate to one another in society. A new nation created in liberty and based on the proposition that all men are created equal. Today we are fighting a great war, and this is the point. Uh, you know, none of us does things in order to receive a reward, but uh, an award. But when it happens, I think it touches me deeply. It means that this organization and its members followed my work.
democracy values each person individually and equally, even if the majority do not. And the rule of law is nothing if it does not support true democratic values. I'm ready to keep on keeping on. And so I want to thank you uh, for your faith in justice and your willingness to work for peace. It's a great honor that our engagement is recognized and that in July, a woman, the President Ursula von der Leyen, will travel to the World Law Congress in New York to receive the World Peace and Liberty Award. As you saw, the World Jurist Association promotes the rule of law mainly by organizing discussion events and recognizing those individuals who have stood out in promoting and strengthening the rule of law. To close this Congress's cycle of recognitions, we announce the awardings of the Medal of Honor of the World Jurist Association and the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Medal of Honor. It is my privilege to introduce to you Sherilyn Eiffel, the immediate past president of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, who will come to the podium to provide the laudatio for David Mills, trustee of the World Law Foundation and professor at Stanford University. Sherilyn. Good morning, Your Majesty, uh, Justice Kennedy, my new friend, President Cremades, and uh, past and current presidents of the ABA, and all of you, uh, thank you so much for having me. He's been called a force in the world of law, politics, and business with the aesthetic of a beat poet. But that description does not begin to capture the depth and breadth of David Mills as a lawyer, a law professor, an intellectual, and a leader. It is true that he gets around. David is as likely to be greeted with warm familiarity by a head of state or United States Senator as he is by Dapper Dan, the iconic haberdasher of the 1980s hip hop world. But that may sound as though David is everything, everywhere, all at once and gives you no window into David's extraordinary, eclectic, problem-solving mind, and doesn't show us how profoundly his professional excellence is driven by a deep sense of compassion and commitment to justice. David Mills is a brilliant tax attorney, a financial powerhouse, a philanthropist. His dear friend, the most um, extraordinary lit litigator, I think, in the country, Ted Wells describes him as a Renaissance man. But the David Mills I have come to know is first and foremost a lawyer, and he's my kind of lawyer. One fiercely and unshakably devoted to the rule of law and to the ideal of equal justice under law. For 10 years, David chaired the board of the organization I led, the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, the organization of lawyers, first founded and led by Thurgood Marshall and responsible for setting the US on the path towards a truly equal society with the Brown versus Board of Education decision from the Supreme Court led by Chief Justice Earl Warren. Earl Warren and Thurgood Marshall, two lawyers without whom which I would be standing here today. David's counsel and support was unparalleled and during those years and since, I have been most privileged to share with him long and deep discussions and strategy sessions about the most intractable legal injustices in our country, about the failings of the US criminal justice system, about the suffering of those who are incarcerated in a system so brutal that those who emerge from it with their souls and minds intact are nothing short of a miracle, about racism and the ways in which our justice system 
far too often betrays its own ideals and those of our country. But David is a doer, not just a thinker. Indeed, David is the quintessential lawyer, which is to say that he is a problem solver, a fearless problem solver. If the problem requires litigation, David is prepared to do it regardless of the unpopularity of a client. He shares that fundamental belief that everyone accused of a crime is entitled to competent counsel. If the problem requires a change in the law, then David will sponsor, write, and help fund the process needed to allow voters to change the law. This was what David did in sponsoring Proposition 36, a response to California's notorious Three Strikes Law, which required life imprisonment for individuals whose third criminal offense might be stealing pizza or golf clubs. Proposition 36 received 70% approval by the voters of California, evidence that David also has his pulse on the zeitgeist. Well over 3,000 people have been released from prisons in California who were facing life in prison under the three strikes law, thanks in large measure to David, and in particular to his creation of a law clinic at Stanford Law School, the Three Strikes Clinic, teaching students and enlisting students in the important work of representing those eligible for release. It is extraordinary that the recidivism rate for those released has remained under 2%, but that wasn't enough for David. He has now become deeply focused on how we can address the mental health needs of those who are incarcerated and the support needs of those who have been released from prison. In this work, he has the support of his extraordinary wife, Anne Devereaux Mills, whose award-winning film, The Return, highlighted the critical work of the Stanford Clinic David created and the challenges facing those who return from prison. David has inspired and shaped thousands of law students and young lawyers. He is a visionary, a champion of the rule of law. And if, as Justice Breyer said in that film, and I believe he is right, we are fighting a great war, David is one of our fiercest and most committed warriors. And for me, he is a dear friend. Please join me in congratulating David Mills on receiving the World Jurist Association Medal of Honor. Thank you, Sherilyn, and congratulations, David. It is now my pleasure to ask to join me Juan Luis Sebrion, Strategic Advisor to the World Law Foundation and Honorary President of El Pais. He is going to pronounce a laudicio for Martin Barron, the former editor of the Washington Post and the Boston Globe. Her Majesty, Excellencies, the World Jurist Association was founded 60 years ago in defense of the rule of law and its contribution to freedom and peace. There is no democracy without the rule of law that guarantees the separation of powers and freedom of expression. The initial laws approved by the constitu constitutionalists of the emerging democratic regimes were precisely those that guaranteed the elimination of censorship and the right to express oneself freely. The First Amendment of the American Constitution guarantees, in the words of James Madison, the freely examining public characters and measures. Freedom of speech, democracy, and rule of law constitu constitute an inseparable trial in defense of the rights of citizens and human dignity. The World Jurist Association, therefore, wants to recognize today the indispensable role of independent journalists in defense and extension of the rule of law in the person of one of the most mythical and brilliant journalists in the history of mass media, Marty Barron. Barron 
is an example of dedication to informing for the benefit of public interest and in defense of individual rights. His contribution to journalists began early in the Miami Herald, on which he became later executive editor. And from those beginnings, he worked in other newspapers of international prestige, such as LA Times or the New York Times. But his worldwide recognition is mainly due to his work at the Boston Globe as executive editor. There, the newspaper investigates uh, in recognition of the, the work he has been done. The newspaper investigation into the sexual abuse of minors, silenced and denied repeatedly by the authorities of the Catholic Church, is still an example of service to the community, defense of victims, and demand of reparation for them. But it also marked the beginning of a process of renewal of the church on attitude of which Pope Francis has shown very recent signs. In a polarized and warring war, where threats to democracy is manipulation grow daily, Barum has been a champion of truth. Truth against post-truth, against fake news, official secrets, and the lack of transparency of power, of all powers, so often sealed in the reason of a state or public security that in reality many times only seek to protect impunity. His last performance as editor-in-chief of the Washington Post, another paper that marked the milestone with the publication of the Pentagon Papers, has signed the personal trajectory of Barron, who, who has not ceased to denounce the threats, pressures, and crimes of the established order in many countries against journalists and against freedom of speech. The illiberal tendencies of many representative democracies the resort of to lies, to the manipulation of public opinion, political correctness, and practices of intellectual cancellation are also forms of censorship against which free citizens must protect and defend themselves. The right to know belongs to them. In the words of the Italian Eugenio Scalfari, a journalist is people who tell the people what happens to the people doing so with the humility, simplicity, and courage with which Baron has carried it out is an example for those who, who believe in the rule of law and freedom of expression. Thank you very much, my dear friend Martin, and many congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, and congratulations, Martin. And the Awards will be uh, awarded at the end of the ceremony. It is now my pleasure to ask to join me at the podium uh, Barit Rees Anderson, the chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee. She will be pronouncing a laudicio for the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs, represented by His Excellency Miguel de Serpa Suarez under Secretary General for the Legal Affairs and UN Legal Council. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies. This morning, uh, the Chief Justice of New York used metaphors from the kitchen to provide his opinion. I will also do so. Because in the process of creating peace, there are two very important ingredients to the dish. And it is legal framework and reliable institutions. Legal framework and reliable institutions to promote the rule of law uh, are also the importance of OLA, the Office of Legal Affairs to the United Nations. This office has led an inconspicuous existence to the public at large, but in fact, it plays a leading role in promoting international law. 
It also holds the very important function of being the depository body for international treaties and conventions. And it keeps order in interstate binding regulations. And by carrying out these tasks, OLA is a great contributor to the basic mandate of the United Nations, peace and security. And I congratulate OLA, represented by Miguel de Sarpa Soares, of being recognized for its very important work by receiving the Medal of Honors from the World Jurist Association. Now, the question was also raised this morning, is this medal equal in prestige to the Nobel Prize? I cannot settle that dispute, but I will tell you that Alfred Nobel, in fact, didn't like lawyers very much. <laughs> So I'm very grateful to the World Jurist Association of having created a prize, a medal, that is almost as prestigious as the Nobel Prize. My congratulations. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to ask to come to the podium Brad Karp, who is a trustee of the World Law Foundation and chairman of the law firm of Paul Weiss. He will be giving a laudatio for Jed S. Rakoff, the senior judge of the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, and we then invite the Honorable Judge Rakoff to make some remarks. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Excellency. Good afternoon, Justice Kennedy. Uh, good afternoon, other dignitaries and attendees. It's my great honor and privilege to present the 2023 Rule of Law Award to my friend and distinguished jurist, scholar, and public servant, Judge Jed Rakoff. This award recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the rule of law it is impossible to imagine a more deserving recipient than Judge Rakoff, who has spent more than 50 years promoting and safeguarding the rule of law. Everyone knows about Judge Rakoff's legendary career on the United States District Court for the Southern District of New York, where he has served for distinction, with distinction since March of 1996. What you do not know, and what Judge Rakoff might not even know, is that today happens to be Judge Rakoff's 10,000th day as a federal district court judge. And as you will hear, Judge Rakoff has made the very most of each of those 10,000 days. Judge Rakoff's entire life, a truly remarkable and unimaginably impactful life, has been committed to supporting and protecting the rule of law in its multiple and varied dimensions. Throughout his professional life, Judge Rakoff has been a stalwart champion of judicial independence, a fierce protector of democracy and freedom, a staunch defender of the most fundamental and cherished liberties and rights enshrined in our Constitution, a compelling advocate for justice in all of its forms, and a faithful adherent of principle and fairness. Judge Rakoff has also been one of our nation's most prolific and influential thought leaders, writing numerous books, dozens of articles, hundreds of speeches, and thousands of judicial opinions, which have shaped the law, enriched public discourse, and safeguarded our system of justice. And on the side, Judge Rakoff has somehow found the time to teach thousands of students at Harvard, Columbia, NYU, and other law schools. It is not hyperbole to say that during his unparalleled legal career, Judge Rakoff has helped shape the law on every issue of consequence in American society. His writings and his judicial decisions 
have had an enormous impact, not just in the United States, but across the globe as well. And Judge Rakoff has been widely lauded by the popular press for his contributions to justice. Rolling Stone magazine has described Judge Rakoff as the legal hero of our time. The Atlantic has described the judge as our nation's legal conscience. Fortune named Judge Rakoff one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. The Wall Street Journal referred to Judge Rakoff as the people's judge. The New York Times described Judge Rakoff as the perfect judge for our times. And Time Magazine has called Judge Rakoff a 21st century avenger of injustices. Judge Rakoff has often said that his approach to judicial service reflects the influences of his early life and his extraordinarily varied career. Judge Rakoff earned his BA at Swarthmore in English literature, where he served as president of the student council and editor-in-chief of the high school newspaper. 60 years ago, before the summer before his senior year at Swarthmore, 20-year-old Jed Rakoff traveled to the Washington Mall where he heard Martha, Martin Luther King deliver the iconic I Have a Dream speech. Judge Rakoff then went on to earn a master's of philosophy at Oxford and a law degree at Harvard. Early in his career, after a brief stint in private corporate law, Judge Rakoff spent seven years as a federal prosecutor in the Southern District of New York's U.S. Attorney's Office, including two years as head of its unit combating business, crime, and securities fraud. Judge Rakoff then spent several years in private practice uh, where he headed the white collar criminal defense groups at two large corporate firms before he was nominated to the federal bench by President Clinton, who we heard earlier on the recommendation of the legendary New York Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Today, as our country continues its descent into warring ideological factions, Judge Rakoff provides a shining example of an alternative path, a humane progressive with a distinctly pragmatic and dare I say uniquely courageous approach to jurisprudence. More than any judge I know, Judge Rakoff approaches legal problems with a unique brand of curiosity and creativity. There are no sacred cows. Every issue, large and small, is challenged and questioned, always through the prism of whether the rule or principle at issue is fair, is just, is equitable, is sensible. As I know all too well from personal experience, it is no answer in Judge Rakoff's courtroom to say that this is how a particular issue has been handled for decades, or this is how other judges or courts have approached the issue. To Judge Rakoff, fairness and doing justice are paramount. Orthodoxy and convention are irrelevant. This approach is conspicuously absent from virtually all modern jurisprudence. There are too many examples of Judge Rakoff's unique brand of jurisprudence to catalog here this morning, but let me mention just one. One of Judge Rakoff's earliest, most high-profile rulings was issued in 2002 when he struck down the federal death penalty statute as unconstitutional in violation of the United States Constitution's due process clause. And there have been many, many other iconic, courageous, just rulings in the 21 years subsequently. Among J Judge Rakoff's greatest legacies are the thousands of lawyers he has mentored and taught over the decades. Many have become remarkable lawyers and jurists in their own right. I consider myself someone who has been deeply enriched by Judge Rakoff. To his legions of law clerks, colleagues, and friends, Judge Rakoff is beloved, brilliant, funny, open-hearted, the epitome of civility and grace, approachable. Judge Rakoff, on behalf of the World Jurist Association and the entire global legal community, I thank you and I salute you for your extraordinary service and your enduring legacy. You are a source of inspiration and admiration for all of us. Please join me in congratulating Judge Rakoff and honoring him as we present him with the Rule of Law Award.
So, uh, Your Majesty, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, and all the other honchos here today, <laughs> uh, I want to uh, thank, uh, deeply thank uh, Brad Carr for those really extraordinary remarks. Uh, my beautiful wife, uh, Anne, who is here, will now come forward and give the rebuttal. <laughs> it's hard to overstate the benefits of the rule of law to civilized society. As others here today have already indicated, the rule of law is the chief alternative to violence and war, to oppression and dictatorship, to corruption and cynicism, and to anarchy and chaos. But the sad fact is that despite these obvious benefits, the rule of law is declining throughout much of the world. For example, the Brookings Institution annually assesses the state of the rule of law in 140 countries using an index that measures eight factors, constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, openness of government, protection of fundamental rights, maintenance of order and security, regulatory enforcement, fair and effective provision of civil justice and fair and effective provision of criminal justice. Using this index, not only has the rule of law in most countries steadily declined over the last five years and more, but in many countries it has declined in most, if not all, of these eight measures. Very grim. Closely linked to this decline has been the steady decline over the past decade and more of those countries that can fairly be called working democracies. In 2003, the peak year for worldwide democracy, 60% of all nation states were working democracies, some of them only recently reformed from dictatorships and totalitarianism. But since that time, no fewer than 20% of those democracies have been replaced by authoritarian regimes, with still more failures seemingly in the offing. What accounts for this grim picture? As you might imagine, different political scientists offer differing theories, ranging from an absence of democratic traditions in many new democracies, to the opportunism of democratically elected leaders who are determined to hold on to their power no matter what the cost to democratic institutions, to broader economic difficulties and the baneful effect of the pandemic, to the systematic undercutting of democracy by certain foreign powers, and so forth and so on. But at least one thing is clear. The greatest upholders of the rule of law are the judges. And when the judges succumb to the dictators or are forced to become mere figureheads, the rule of law effectively disappears. Fortunately, the benefits of the rule of law are so obvious to the people of the world that they will never be truly satisfied with anything less. And courageous people throughout the world, not least many judges, will never willingly submit to the loss of the rule of law. But whether in this cruel and violent world of ours, the efforts of these people of courage will prevail remains uncertain. Still, we must all be grateful to these judges and to the Rural Jurist Association for doing their best to preserve the rule of law. And therefore, I am very honored to receive this award. Thank you very much. Thank you and congratulations, Judge Rakoff. It is now my privilege to ask to come to the podium His Excellency Ivan Duque, former president of Colombia, 
to pronounce a logicio for Santiago Martinez Garrido, General Secretary and Secretary of the Board of Directors of Iberdrola. President Duque. Good morning, good afternoon, Your Majesty, distinguished guests, excellencies. It is a great honor for me in this marvelous day to present for the first time on behalf of the World Juries Organization the Sustainable Development Goals Honor Medal. And we're giving it to Iberdrola, a company that represents the values of the ethics of the 21st century when it comes to sustainability. We're giving it to the Secretary General, Santiago Martinez, and we also extend our high appreciation to Ignacio Galan, who is not here with us today for previous commitments. Nevertheless, what I want to resultate this morning is that the challenges of our time imply that companies go beyond profit and embrace the values of sustainability, sustainability, combining technologies to reduce the carbon footprint, and more importantly, to reach carbon neutrality and to teach by example. Iberdrola has become a leader in the energy sector. And the Harvard Business School, in a very prominent case, has said that Iberdrola is leading the energy revolution. Iberdrola has been able to basically bring to zero the energy that has been generated in the past through diesel and coal, and has become the leader in a market when it comes to non-conventional renewable energies. And that has to be praised. But what is interesting is that that reduction of the carbon footprint is today part of a broader discussion. And companies like Iberdrola are the ones that should be highlighted in the science-based targets initiative, to give an example. But beyond that transformation in the energy sector, Iberdrola has a very powerful corporate governance not only empowering women and having fair payments, but also guaranteeing the transparency of its information so that stakeholders and citizens can monitor and scrutinize their work. And if it comes to ESG models, Iberdrola has also been able to create volunteering as a core value within the corporation and has provided pro bono legal services to low-income communities, and has also gotten involved to the dear protection of minority and their rights. For all those reasons, ladies and gentlemen, it is a privilege to give to Iberdrola the Sustainable Development Goals Medal. Thank you very much. Thank you, President Duque. It is now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Deborah Enix Ross, President of the American Bar Association, who will join us to do a laudicio for Brad Karp, Trustee of the World Law Foundation and Chairman of Paul Weiss. Good afternoon. It is a pleasure to stand before you as president of the American Bar Association, but also as a native New Yorker, and to welcome and thank you for choosing my hometown for this special occasion. It's my honor to help the World Jurist Association recognize a singularly exceptional lawyer and community leader, Brad Karp. As I was listening to Brad introduce the judge, I kept saying to myself, 
I should just simply say ditto, which means the same, and sit down because the very words that you use to describe him are words that we use to describe you. But I will try and add to that. You are not only an exceptional, extraordinarily brilliant lawyer for your clients, but also an outstanding leader in, our, in your firm, in our profession, and on behalf of pressing issues of social justice and the rule of law. Many of you have heard already that Brad has been the chairman of Paul Weiss since 2008. And he is one of our country's leading litigators and corporate advisors. He has successfully guided numerous Fortune 100 companies, global financial institutions, and individuals through some of their bet the company litigations, regulatory matters, internal investigations, and corporate crises. And since you described the way the judge has been described, I'm going to say how Brad has been described. Chambers says that he is, quote, the best strategic advisor in the business. He's the best litigator in the country and someone who every CEO in America should have on speed dial. I don't know if we use speed dial anymore, but <laughs> you should have them on speed dial. According to both the New York Times and Bloomberg, he is the most connected lawyer in the country. But in addition to those honorifics, what struck me about Brad and his career is that in every instance, in all of his recognitions, it is for not only successfully representing his clients, but also his legal achievements for the role he plays in the legal profession, the business community, and the public interest sphere. He is active in community service and serving on numerous public interest, educational, cultural, and charitable boards. The list is so long that we would be here through the weekend if I described each one of them. But I will say what runs through all of his pro bono and public service accomplishments is a fierce desire to improve our communities, to make life better for our citizens. He speaks and writes on business litigation, securities litigation, corporate governance, crisis management, and ESG. He has spoken at more than 700 conferences. I guess today would be 701. And he has lectured at Harvard Law School, Yale Law School, Columbia Law School, NYU Law School, Harvard Business School, Harvard Kennedy School, the Yale School of Management, and the Federal Judicial Center. Prominently missing from that list is lecturing at the University of Miami, my alma mater, so I'm offering you that opportunity, Brad, and I hope you will take us up on that. But when you speak and you write about the pressing issues of social justice and the rule of law, you do it with power and conviction. And those topics have included gun control, voter suppression and disenfranchisement, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in fact, Brad currently serves as co-chair of the New York State Bar Association Task Force on Advancing Diversity and he serves as a co-chair on the New York Attorney General's Reproductive Choice Task Force. It is my honor, it is my privilege to say to you, Brad, you are indeed a role model for lawyers everywhere, and we are so pleased today to honor you. Congratulations.
Thank you, Deborah, and congratulations, Brad. It is now my pleasure to ask to join me His Excellency Miguel de Serpa Suarez, Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs and UN Legal Counsel, who will be coming to the podium to acknowledge the awarding of the World Jurist Association Medals of Honor on behalf of all the awardees. Your Excellency. Your Majesty, Excellences, I wish to thank the World Jurist Association on behalf of all the awardees for the medals of honor that we are receiving today from the association in an emblematic space, the headquarters of the United Nations. Paraphrasing the charter of the United Nations, we are the house of we the people. Women and men, as the preamble, who as the preamble of the charter states are determined to establish conditions under which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained. And on this occasion, it is my pleasure to be joined here by professionals who have contributed in their personal capacity or through the entities that they represent, where they work or have worked for the promotion of justice, international law, and more generally, to the development of the rule of law. The association has been able to bring to these awards uh, experts from various areas and with different perspectives of the legal professional, as well as experts from the media, and more broadly, the rule of law community. Embedded in the preamble of our charter, rule of law is of central importance to this organization and, of course, to countries across the globe which have recognized its critical role in promoting peaceful and inclusive societies, providing access to justice for all, and building effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. The ceremony reminds us that through the last 77 years, the United Nations has demonstrated its unique role both as a place where international law particularly in the form of multilateral treaties, is developed, and also as an actor directly participating in the making and interpretation of international law. One month ago, in this very room, we witnessed a victory for multilateralism, culminating two decades of work to adopt a breakthrough treaty to counter the destructive trends facing ocean health now and for generations to come. Today, I feel proud to receive this award on behalf of the women who are a majority in my office, I have to say, and men who make possible through their daily commitment and professionalism that the Office of Legal Affairs, established in 1946, continues to support the United Nations as a unique platform to address contemporary global challenges through an inclusive, networked and effective multilateralism rooted in international law. Your Majesty, Excellences, colleagues, Mr. Kromadas, once again, on all behalf of all the awardees of the World Jurist Association Medals of Honor, and on behalf of the women and men at the Office of Legal Affairs, thank you. Muchas gracias. Congratulations, Your Excellency. It is now my pleasure to invite to join me on the stage His Excellency Robert Ray, Ambassador of, of Canada to the United Nations, who will pronounce a laudicio for Rosalie Abella, who is the Justice of the Supreme Court of Canada from 2004 to 2021, and who will be awarded the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Medal of Honor. And after the introduction, we invite Judge Obella to make brief remarks. Your Majesty, um, Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is my distinct honor to speak today in praise 
of Rosalie Silberman Abella, whom I have known as a friend and, dare I say it, as a mentor since we met at the University of Toronto. She may not remember, I do, very vividly, in the autumn of 1967. Madam Justice Abella, as you will discover when you hear her, is truly a force of nature. She was born in a displaced persons camp near Stuttgart, Germany. Her parents, Jacob and Fanny, were survivors of concentration camps during the Holocaust, and they came to Canada in 1950. From a very early age, Rosie, as we all know her, knew that she wanted to be a lawyer. She was appointed to Ontario's family court at the age of 29, a decision that was made by the Attorney General at the time that uh, was groundbreaking. She later, in 1984, was appointed as a Royal Commissioner for Employment Equity. Her report in 1985 literally transformed the debate in our country and in many other countries on the critical question of dealing with systemic discrimination and its consequences for our societies. After then serving on many boards and commissions, she was appointed to Ontario's Court of Appeal in 1992 and to our Supreme Court in 2004, where she served for 17 years before her retirement. She is a spectacularly worthy recipient of the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Award. She has been indefatigable in the pursuit of justice and singularly persuasive in framing the debate globally on what justice means in the real world. Yes, justice is about processes, to be sure, but it is also about substantive outcomes. And it is that simple, single message that Rosie has taken to all of the work that she's done on the court, all of her analysis that she's presented, and in the remarkable leadership which she has shown for so long. It is no exaggeration to say that Rosie Abella has been changing the world since childhood. Her charm, her humor, her energy and passion, her steadfast love and loyalty to family and friends, all these have been her hallmarks. Coupled with her intelligence and brilliance in legal reasoning, as well as her vast interest in literature, she truly is a woman for all seasons and for all reasons. Together with her late husband, Irving, a brilliant scholar and great teacher, and their two sons, JJ and Zach, and their children, she has also had a remarkably rich family life which has informed all of her values and all of her character. No one person in my country has done more to explain the importance of equality, of justice, and of equity, and to ensure their impact on the real lives of Canadian women and men. No single person has done more than Rosalie Silberman Abella. Now, some of you might think particularly in this audience, and particularly when you see Rosie, you might say, oh, wait a minute, Rosie is just, is just Canada's Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Well, in Canada, we think a little differently. We believe that Rosie is just Rosie, a uniquely gifted person who has shown all of us what greatness and goodness are and what can happen when you decide to make their pursuit your purpose in life. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce Rosalie Abella. Your Excellencies, your Majesty, distinguished colleagues, you have just heard from one of the most extraordinary, most brilliant, and most admired lawyers and public servants in Canada. 
He's been a close friend for almost 60 years, and I think now you can see why. He is also proof that with hard work and patience, even men can make it to the top. <laughs> Happy 60th birthday to the World Jurist Association, and thank you for the magnificent honor of awarding the Ruth Bader Ginsburg Award to me. The incandescent Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a jurist, a woman, and a Jew. It was a defining combination that shaped her vision and her passions, transforming her from distinguished Supreme Court justice to iconic global metaphor. When she pursued justice on the Supreme Court, she was a judicial juggernaut who was catapulted into international orbit by two forces, enthusiastic gratitude for her ever bolder judgments, but as time went on, also the vituperative reaction of an increasingly regressive climate in which those progressive judgments were anathema. Regrettably, that regressive climate is where we are today especially about the judiciary. The critics call the good news of an independent judiciary the bad news of judicial autocracy. They call women and minorities seeking the right to be free from discrimination special interest groups seeking to jump the queue. They call efforts to reverse discrimination, reverse discrimination. They say courts should only interpret, not make law, thereby ignoring the entire history of common law. They call advocates for diversity biased and defenders of social stagnation impartial. They claim a monopoly on truth, use invectives to assert it, then accuse their detractors of personalizing the debate. They prefer ideology to ideas, replacing the exquisite demographic choreography of checks and balances with the myopic march of majoritarianism. All of this has put us at the edge of a global future unlike any I've ever seen in my life. We're in a mean-spirited moral free-for-all, a climate polluted by bombastic insensitivity, anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, Islamophobia, and discrimination generally. Too often law and justice are in a dysfunctional relationship, too often hate kills, truth is homeless, and lives don't matter. Too many governments have interfered with the independence of their judges and media. Too many people have died. Too many people are hungry. Too many people have lost hope. And too many children will never get to grow up, period, let alone grow up in a moral universe that bends towards justice. We need to put justice back in charge. And to do that, we need to put compassion back in the service of law and law in the service of humanity. We need the rule of justice, not just the rule of law. Otherwise, what's the point of law, or lawyers, or a legal system? What good is the rule of law if there's no justice? And to make justice happen, we can never forget how the world looks to those who are vulnerable. It's what I consider to be the law's majestic purpose and the legal profession's noble mandate. In 1948, Having seen the horrendous cost of discrimination in World War II, the global community here at the United Nations made a commitment through the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that it would protect the world from inhumanity. Yet more and more, the arc of the moral universe is bending away from, not towards justice. For me, this is not just theory. As you heard from Ambassador Ray, I was born in a displaced persons camp in Germany on July 1st, 1946. My parents who got married in Poland on September the 3rd, 1939, spent most of the war in concentration camps. Their two and a half year old son, and my father's whole family were murdered at Treblinka. Miraculously, my parents survived and after the war ended up in Stuttgart, 
where my father, who was a lawyer, taught himself English and was hired by the Americans as counsel for displaced persons in Southwest Germany. When we came to Canada in 1950 as Jewish refugees, he was told he couldn't practice law because he wasn't a citizen. He died a month before I finished law school and never lived to see his inspiration take flight in his daughters or his two grandsons whom he never met. But he knew it would turn out all right because he was confident in Canada's generosity and how right he was. A few years ago, my mother gave me some of my father's papers from Germany. One of the most powerful documents I found was written by my father when he was head of the displaced persons camp in Stuttgart where we lived. It was his introduction to Eleanor Roosevelt when she came to visit our DP camp in 1948. He said, we welcome you, Mrs. Roosevelt, as the representative of a great nation whose victorious army liberated the remnants of European Jewry from death and so highly contributed to their moral and physical rehabilitation. We shall never forget that aid rendered by the American people and army. We are not in a position of showing you many assets. The best we are able to produce are these few children. They alone are our fortune and our sole hope for the future. As one of those children, I am here to tell you that the gift of hope is the gift that keeps right on giving, propelling me from a displaced persons camp in Germany all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada. My life started in a country where there had been no democracy, no rights, no justice. No one with this history does not feel lucky to be alive and free. No one with this history takes anything for granted. And no one with this history does not feel that we have a particular duty to wear our identities with pride and to promise our children that we will do everything humanly possible to keep the world safer for them than it was for their grandparents. A world where all children, regardless of race, color, religion, or gender, can wear their identities with dignity, with pride, and in peace. I am I am very proud to be a member of the legal profession, but I'll never forget why I joined it. Thank you. Thank you, Justice. Um, may I please uh, invite Your Majesty, King Felipe, President Javier Cremades, and the Honorable Henry Molina to come forward to the center and we will bestow the various World Justice Association medals. Thank you. David Mills, will you please come forward to receive the WJA Champion of the Rule of Law Medal of Honor. Congratulations. Martin Barron, will you please come forward to receive the WJA Freedom of Speech Medal of Honor. Congratulations. 
Your Excellency Miguel de Serpa Suarez, Under Secretary General for Legal Affairs, uh, will you please come forward to receive the WJA Champion of the Rule of Law Medal of Honor on behalf of the United Nations Office of Legal Affairs. Congratulations. <laughs> Judge Jed Rakoff, Your Honor, will you please come forward to receive the WJA Champion of the Rule of Law Medal of Honor. Congratulations. Santiago Martinez Garrido, General Secretary uh, and Secretary of the Board of Directors of Aperdola, please come forward to receive the WJA SDG Pioneer in Legal Practice Medal of Honor. Brad Karp, please come forward to receive the WJA Legal <laughs> Practice Medal of Honor. <laughs> Ambassador Ray, if you would rejoin us on the stage. Justice Rosalia Bella, please come forward to bestow and receive the WJA Ruth Bader Ginsburg Award. The Honorable Henry Molina, please come forward to say a word. Your Majesty. Your Royal Majesty, uh, Felipe VI, King of Spain. Distinguished Ministers of Government, Presidents of the various judicial powers here present, President Javier Cremades, President of the World Jurist Association and members of this Congress, distinguished personalities participating at this closing ceremony of the World Law Congress. I'd like to express my thanks for the presence here at this event of the American, uh, the Dominican uh, ambassador in Washington on behalf of His Excellency the President of the Republic, the Dominican Republic. I also uh, welcome the President of the Constitutional Court of the Dominican Republic and the judges of the Supreme Court and other judges, and also welcome the members of the uh, diplomatic corps, civil society, and professionals from the press, all here as part of the Dominican delegation at this Congress. Distinguished colleagues, friends, in our world, the rule of law continues to face many of the challenges that decades ago gave rise to the 
uh, creation of the World's Jurist Association and which led to uh, this event, which, which we now call the World Law Congress. The totalitarianisms, political, ideological politicization of the world and the threat of a new war were in the minds of the very founders of this organization. Today, these great challenges have not at all disappeared. Indeed, added to these, we see even greater, more complex challenges, bringing with them other types of concerns of equal importance. We see increasing inequalities between those who have a lot and those who have nothing. Those who have uncontrolled wealth and those who barely have enough to make ends meet. Based on these contrasts, we see popularism and mistrust among many towards democracy. This is endangering justice and the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, the enemies of democracy and freedom are undermining in our institutions. Judicial independence, which is a guarantee for everybody, is being constantly threatened. Corruption and failures to comply with the law are undermining the credibility and protection of democratic institutions. The absurd congestion that we see and the lack of transparency within judicial agendas is uh, taking credibility away from the uh, legal justice systems. The response to this issue cannot be found in the same recipes of the past. We are expected to come up with solutions in line with current times. People needs, need up-to-date justice systems that strengthen the rule of law and that guarantee the dignity of people. Dialogue on this and other fundamental topics for the rule of law is essential to address the present and future challenges in the world. And this is the call made by the World Jur Juris Association for the World Law Congress for 2025. This is a commitment being made by the Dominican Republic to once again meet as drivers of the law and freedom. We would be honoured to have you with us. Distinguished colleagues, friends, we are a country with a rich history of growth and democratic progress. We are geographically located in the Caribbean. The Dominican Republic is a beautiful meeting point with a specific culture and excellent nature. Every day uh, we are upholding more rule, the, the rule of law, peace and justice. Let us work more to uh, um, uphold our justice systems, broaden access to them and to ensure full transparency in their exercise. Believe me that when I say that we will be delighted to be able to host the World Law Congress, Your Majesty, on behalf of the Dominican Republic, Formally, we invite you to come to the opening for the World Law Congress in 2025. As judges say, the invitation is valid for all of you here represented. Thank you. We have a very brief video to begin the presentation of the 2025 World Law Congress. In February of 2025, you have a date in the heart of the Caribbean. It's a country that's growing daily. 
setting new goals for itself and always open to greet visitors with a smile. The Dominican Republic and its capital, Santo Domingo. We're excited to host the 2025 World Law Congress and to share our rich natural environment, world-class accommodations, and diverse cultural attractions. We are currently building in our country the judiciary of the future, striving for a justice system that is efficient, transparent, and inclusive at the same time. This is why in 2025, we will be even more interested in exchanging ideas with the global legal community, strengthening together the rule of law in all of the Americas and beyond. Judges, lawyers, academics, officials, and professionals from all over the world will come to the Dominican Republic to share their knowledge and experience. And we want you to be one of them. So join us in the Dominican Republic, February of 2025. We're waiting for you. Dominican Republic, world capital of law and justice. President Cremades, do you wish to close us out? Thank you. Very briefly, we have already consumed all of our time this morning. I think it was really worth it to make the trip, to make the effort. First of all, thanks to my king, Felipe VI. Uh, thank you for your leadership, promoting the rule of law around the world. You know it by the experience with this uh, constitution. You're a constitutional king. And uh, we all uh, thank your leadership by always supporting what we are doing from the World Jurist Association. Thank you very much, His Majesty, Your Majesty. <laughs> thanks. Thanks to the awardees. I would say that, you know, we have here a real beautiful uh, collection of what human being can do to, to promote a real purpose, which is not connected just with your own dignity, but with freedom and humanity of all of our fellow citizens. So thank you very much. And I would like to say particularly, Mrs. Isabella, I don't know where you have a, a brand of being firm or cold, whatever. I don't, I don't know. It's the first time I, I hear you. But uh, I was very touched. You, you were emotional. I got emotional. And I think many people here got emotional because rule of law is also emotional. Thank you very much. We'll see you in the Republic. Thank you.